right, I'm going to start in a second. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for migrating down from, uh, from the other room. So the, um, the first couple of talks that are on the schedule for today are going to be very informal. It's really just myself and Andy talking through some of the design aspects of the Donkey Car project from a hardware perspective and also from a software perspective. Right now, Andy has not come back from the other room, so I might be standing here talking for a while. We'll see what happens. Um, so the project that was assembled is based on a project that started, um, I think it was about a year ago, and it's um, designed to be a platform for demonstrating the use of TensorFlow and machine learning um, in a, a physical device. And it's, um, it's really neat to have a little self-contained device like this, because a lot of the time when you're talking about machine learning, it's in an abstract sense, or it might be doing things like applying um, recognition to photos, but that's something that all happens within the computer. And if you can take um, machine learning principles and apply them to a physical platform, it gives you a great way of being able to demonstrate it. And the donkey car was designed to be uh, easy to assemble from readily available modules. And the picture you can see there is basically like the reference donkey car design. And it's got a, um, a fairly common RC chassis, which you can buy from Hobby King or wherever. It's powered by a Raspberry Pi. It has a Pi camera on it. And the steering and throttle are controlled by the module that you can see there a little bit to the left on the front, oh, actually on the back of the car, because um, the camera is on the front. And that is a servo driver module, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And typically they're powered from something like a USB power brick. So by going out and getting those different elements, which are all readily available, and those little servo driver boards cost about $1.70 or something on AliExpress, and with some jumper wires, you can put together one of these platforms fairly easily. And um, we thought this would be a really good project to assemble for the Open Hardware Miniconf, but what we wanted to do was not just buy a few off-the-shelf modules and get people plugging in some jumper wires, and then the job is done. We really wanted to uh, have something that was a little bit neater in terms of integrating the electronics, but also give people an opportunity to solder some parts together. So the project that you've built, um, which you can see there for those that didn't do it this morning, is really just an integrated version of what you see on the official donkey car design. So if you look at the, um, the reference design, in terms of the way the circuit works and everything else, it's pretty much the same. It's just that we've put it all into a neat little circuit board. So what I'm going to do now is just show you the, um, the schematic and some of the, um, the issues of the way the circuit itself works and some of the interesting things about it. So the, um, uh, oh, and also a little gotcha I should mention. Um, now this is part of the uh, PCB layout for that hat that um, is on the, the thing. And you can see the, um, the labels there, steering and throttle, which are the two servo connections, are the values of the parts that are in the schematic. And um, actually a little bit of a backstory to this. The board that you end up with is not actually the board that you're meant to end up with. Um, the design for the, um, the hat was done a couple of months ago, and um, John Spencer in Melbourne put a lot of work into designing a hat that added a whole lot of extra features. So it had an EEPROM on it to be an official Raspberry Pi hat, so it would identify itself. It had an MPU9250 uh, IMU on it so that it could do um, nine degree of freedom analysis. It had uh, ultrasonic sensors on it so that we could extend uh, and do collision avoidance and various things like that. And part of the process was that he finished the design and then we discussed doing assembly with a factory in China, uh, which is a quite well-known PCB factory, and they turn around PCBs very quickly. Something that I've seen quite a lot recently is that a lot of Chinese PCB factories are now adding, are providing value-add services, like assembly services. And they've recently started doing a, an assembly service, so we thought, we'll give it a try. 
And uh, so the design files were sent off and we got the response back from them saying the PCBs have been fabricated, we're moving on with it. Everything looked to be on schedule. And then um, there was silence from them. And the way we'd projected the schedule, we were expecting to have received the boards a couple of weeks ago and have time to do testing and everything else. And um, a couple of weeks went by with no response to email. And then eventually when we got an answer from them, it was, oh, we've placed an order for some of the parts now and we should have actually received the boards by then. And then a follow up which was, oh, we can't get some of these parts. And it just kept going on and on. So it, Monday week ago, it was, yeah, Monday morning, a Monday week ago, uh, I started to have a bit of a panic and thought we really need an alternative plan for this. So I pulled out Eagle and in about three hours laid out a simplified version of the circuit, sent it off for uh, fabrication and got the boards back four days later and had them assembled the day after that. So um, what you have here and what I'm showing you on this schematic is this last minute rush job that we just got working basically a day or two before we jumped on the plane to come over here. So that's why there's a little bodge wire on it and there are a couple of things stuffed up. But that brings me back to this point, which is the steering and throttle. On the reference design for the donkey car, um, the throttle is on channel zero and the steering is on channel one, which is exactly what it says here. And when I was rushing this design through and I did the silk screen for it, I somehow managed to do that and didn't notice. So the way the, um, the system is set up at the moment, what we've done is swapped the configuration uh, file, uh, in the configuration file, it swaps channel zero and one. So the difference between what you have and the official donkey car setup is that the throttle and steering are on opposite channels. <laughs> it does, yes. Uh, we've had this a couple of times because we have some cars running the original configuration, some cars running the switch configuration, and if you start it up the wrong way around, all of a sudden the car takes off across the room. So um, that's just one thing to keep in mind. If you're looking at the official donkey car design, steering and throttle are swapped. Okay, so there, um, there is one thing on the, the hat that we haven't used um, in the context of this project, which is the LEDs. And um, these aren't on a normal donkey car either. Now, there is one interesting little trick on this, and I was just talking to Mark about this before the break. You've probably seen uh, addressable RGB LEDs. There are a couple in the room somewhere. And they generally, a WS2812B, or um, most people just refer to them as NeoPixels, which I never do for reasons that I won't get into right now, um, run on five volts. So they are an LED with a built-in PWM driver, which allows it to uh, control the brightness on the red, green, and blue independently so you can do different colors. And by daisy chaining them together, you can send a, um, a string, essentially, or a sequence of RGB values, and then set a large number of them to independent uh, levels of illumination. Now, the trick is that the driver chip in them needs to run at five volts. And we are running them from a Raspberry Pi, which is 3.3 volts. This is becoming much more common now. A lot of electronics is 3.3 volts or even lower. And a lot of microcontrollers are only 3.3 volts. So you need to be able to interface to devices that don't necessarily uh, operate at that voltage. And the common way to do that is with a level shifter. And there are different techniques you can use for level shifting. But there is a, this interesting little trick, which uh, I did on this PCB. And you can see here that the, um, so we've got data coming in from the left, and it's going into the data in on the first LED, and then you can see the data out on the, the bottom right of that LED goes into data in in the next, and it's a little daisy chain, it passes its way along. And they're all powered by five volts. So we've got five volts right here on the voltage rail of the LED. But the thing is that in order to activate or to see a logic high, it needs to see at least 0.7 of VCC, which means it needs to see 3.5 volts on that data line. So if you connect it directly to a 3.3 volt uh, processor, uh, it may work, 
Um, it often will work, but technically it's out of spec because you're not driving the voltage high enough to actually have a logic high. And even if you are driving it high enough, you might have timing problems, and Mark has seen exactly this happen. So what you can do is drop a little diode into the five volt rail here. And what the effect that has is providing a voltage drop of 0.6 volts so that the LED is now running at 4.4 volts instead of five volts. Now that's high enough that the controller chip inside it will still operate properly. Um, but the critical thing is that it's changed the level that it needs to see a logic high on the input. So now you can drive this from 3.3 volts and definitively drive it beyond the point at which it sees a logic high. So that then raises a question of what happens here. So you can see that the input on the second LED needs 3.5 volts uh, in order to be driven high. But the first LED is actually being driven on a 4.4 volt supply, which means it's going to output 4.4 volts when it goes high. And so that exceeds the threshold and then everything's happy. So the first LED is running at a slightly lower voltage than the rest of the LEDs in the string. Now there is a variation on this that I've seen where you tie the, the power rail of all of the LEDs together and you run them all at that slightly lower voltage. Um, but there are problems with that. It means you get reduced illumination. It means that all of your power is running through the diode that you're feeding them with, so it doesn't scale very well. By doing it this way, what you get is a slightly lower level of illumination on the first one, but then the rest will be illuminated normally. Mark? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, or you simply add another one separately at the start, oh, which is not part of the strip, and then feed the output into the strip. Yep, cool. Uh, yeah, so basically all you need to do is add that, and you can run your addressable strips off 3.3 um, volts. Oops, wrong presentation. So, Okay, let's look at a couple of parts within this design. So the, the major building blocks. And on a, um, on a normal doggy car, some of these are separate modules, but they've just been integrated into the same PCB. So over here, we've got the servo headers, one for the throttle, one for the steering, and I got the labels correct in the schematic, I just didn't get it on the silk screen. So what we've got are PWM channels um, coming from somewhere that you'll see in just a moment going to the headers that the servos connect to. So the way a servo works is that it needs power, so it needs ground and a, a power supply, and then there is one pin which determines the position that the servo moves to, and that uses PWM, which is pulse width modulation. So the, um, the width of the pulses that are sent to it determine the position that it goes to. On the donkey car, it has a servo to control the steering, and then it has an electronic speed controller, or ESC, which controls the motor that drives it. And the ESC is set up so that it behaves exactly like a servo. So you um, just feed it PWM as if it's a servo, and then the position, if it's more than 180 degrees, it's going forwards. If it's less than 180 degrees, it's going backwards. 180 degrees is dead center. Uh, so what else is, okay. So, Talking about the, um, the servo driver, this is the chip that is on that little servo driver board on a standard donkey car. It's an I2C um, PWM controller. Now one of the limitations of the Raspberry Pi, uh, and a lot of people say, like I hear a lot of people say, why would you bother using something like a, a microcontroller when you can use a Raspberry Pi, which is much more powerful. Um, one of the differences or the distinctions between a, a full-fledged computer, essentially like a Raspberry Pi, and a microcontroller is the way timing is handled and also the way interfaces are integrated to deal with different peripherals. On microcontrollers, there is typically hardware assigned to be able to do things like drive PWM signals consistently using a hardware clock, so it's not putting any burden on the software. The software can simply set the configuration of this is the frequency I want and this is the duty cycle I want, and then forget about it. It can get on with doing other things. 
Whereas if you are trying to do that from software, which is the case with most um, CPUs as opposed to microcontrollers, the software has to keep turning the pin on and off in order to generate the signal, which means timing becomes critical. And so one of the areas where microcontrollers tend to be really useful as opposed to a full CPU is if you're integrating with peripherals. So to get around the lack of PWM outputs on a Raspberry Pi, we're using this little device, which basically uh, you can um, send it a command over I squared C and tell it what uh, duty cycle you want on any of 16 outputs. And the chip will then hold that duty cycle while the CPU goes off and does something else. Now this is actually massive overkill for something like a donkey car because we only care about two channels. Uh, and this is a 16 channel chip. But the chip itself is only like 70 cents or something. So um, we might as well just put it down. And it's, um, it's a very commonly available chip. Um, RGB LEDs, so I've already shown you how those work with that little diode trick. Uh, voltage regulator. Now the, um, this is part of the trade-off that was made in doing this last minute rush job. And um, this comes down to a question of what you're optimizing for in your design. So when you're designing hardware, just like with software, all engineering is about compromises and deciding are you going to optimize for performance or for price or for speed of development or ease of testing. Or, and if you optimize for one of those things to an extreme, it can then adversely affect other things. You can make something, if you want to produce something in great quantity, you can put a lot of work into engineering and uh, optimize the design to minimize your bill of materials costs and your testing costs, but you're wearing more cost up front in order to optimize for that, uh, that volume. So uh, in this particular case, because this was a desperate last minute rush board, and I knew that I would be assembling all of these personally by hand with a few hours to spare, I optimized this design for ease of hand assembly. So even though it's got surface mount parts on it, they're pretty easy surface mount parts to put on, so it's not a problem to do. And things like the voltage regulator, uh, when you look at the voltage regulator module that's on it, what I could have done is taken that exact same circuit um, and integrated it directly onto the PCB. So we could have had a single PCB with the voltage regulator and everything else on it, but that would have been a much bigger um, assembly burden for me. So what I decided was it's worth just taking an existing module, you've got some headers, stick it down on a PCB, and then the job is done. So it works out to be more expensive than integrating everything, but when you've got to hand assemble them very quickly, that's the trade-off that you make. So um, a lot of what I do, in terms of when I'm designing circuits, a lot of what I'm doing is making trade-offs or optimizing for things that may not be obvious. And um, that was the particular decision I made in that case. So, um, that's correct. So, how hot? Um, it's rated to one amp nominally. It'll actually go a little bit more than that. Um, it'll get warm, but it shouldn't get very hot. It's a switch mode regulator, which is quite efficient. And it's not dropping all that much power it's going from seven point something volts to five volts. So the amount um, that it has to cut is fairly minimal. And the, um, uh, yeah, it shouldn't get particularly hot. Uh, in terms of the current consumption, the Raspberry Pi itself, when it's working hard, seems to be pulling around 400 to 500 milliamps. So it's only running at 50% capacity of the regulator. Um, it's, it shouldn't be anywhere near its thermal limit. Um, are there any other questions about the hardware while I've got the schematic open? Nope. Are the oh, sorry, what was that? Are the schematics available? Um, I can't remember if I've pushed it to Git or not. It will be. <laughs> um, where is it? Uh, should be, yeah, it'll be like Tapper Open Hardware License. So. I will definitely do that, and I'll make sure that I put a link to it on the, um, the Open Hardware Miniconf site as well. 
Yeah. Oh, Trent. Great question. Um, <laughs> um, what we're going to do there, what you're seeing here at this mini-conf is part of a long-term master plan that Andy has <laughs> had in mind. You'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but there are going to be follow-up events. Because Donkey Car is such a great um, demonstration platform for machine learning, um, the plan is to, use, to run track days and do um, a whole series of events, uh, primarily around Melbourne, because that's where we're based. Uh, but there are definitely events coming up. So the boards are not going to be thrown in the bin, definitely not. Um, they'll probably be kitted up with, um, with more chassis and things, and then used on track days and subsequent events. So um, did you want to talk about that now or later? Or? Soon. Soon? OK. Um, so I know that there are quite a few people who wanted to um, to get the kits and we sold out rather quickly. So if you're in the situation where you're really wanting to try this for yourself, it's possible that we will make some of these available for sale um, after the event. It won't be as cheap as this because this was heavily subsidized to make it easier for people to attend. And um, what we may end up doing, I mean this hasn't been decided yet, we might end up selling just the hat on its own so that you can go out and use whatever chassis you like. You might already have some of the other parts. You've already got a Raspberry Pi, for, for example. You don't need to pay for that twice. So we'll probably end up making the hats available, and um, there will be track days and things in the future as well. Uh, but part of the, um, the purpose of using this project is that because it's based on this very well-documented existing design, there is very little barrier to you going out and replicating this yourself using parts that you can get on eBay. So, uh, yeah, if you follow the documents, the documentation, you can build these yourself for sure. Not drowning, waving. <laughs> is it getting warm up there? Uh, any more questions? Nope. Uh, let's see, is there anything interesting on here? Well, just um, for those who are interested, if you haven't had much exposure to electronics before, I'll just show you um, very briefly the correlation between the schematic and the PCB design itself. Because this, if you're just starting out in hardware, this can sometimes be a bit of a conceptual barrier, because there are really a couple of different ways and radically different ways of representing exactly the same thing. And um, what we're seeing here is the physical representation of the PCB, and um, the black is where there are no tracks, and then there are, um, there are two different colors there. So the red is on the top of the PCB, and the blue is tracks on the bottom of the PCB. This is a relatively simple design. There aren't very many tracks on it, so it's easy to follow what's going on. And if we go back to the, um, the schematic, which is a logical representation, so what we're seeing here is nothing to do with the physical layout of the board. This is simply the logic of how everything connects together, so what signals go to where and what parts are used, and then how you implement this. Um, so this exact same schematic, which defines the logic, could be implemented in a, you know, numerous ways. You could lay out boards in a totally different way physically and still meet the same design um, constraints and, uh, and have exactly the same functionality. So where we define a logical connection here, like um, if I zoom in on here, we can see PWM0. So this uh, pin here, which is coming into the throttle signal, is coming out of the controller down here. Um, that is a logical link, which is then implemented as a track. So if we go back to the board view, and it should be highlighted, you can see that little track right there is a physical implementation of the logical link between those two parts of the schematic. So there is a direct one-to-one -one correlation between the um, the connections in the schematic and the connections on the PCB. The one's physical and one is logical. 
Um, so that's that's all I've got for the hardware side of things, unless there are some more questions. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so the sequence of events basically begins with looking at the major building blocks and typically start, you start in a schematic. So if I'm looking at a project like this, I normally start with, uh, depending on the complexity of it, it might just be in my head or it might be a written document, um, a list of what the requirements are and there'll be major building blocks. For example, I know I need power, so I've got a, I need a voltage regulator or externally regulated power. In this particular case, well, the way most designs work is that there is typically uh, what you know, people often call a hero part, like there'll be a microcontroller or there'll be some significant component of the design that dictates a lot of other things around it. For example, if you pick a specific microcontroller that runs at a certain voltage, that might dictate other things you decide on, like what I.O. chips you use that need to interface with it. So in this particular case, the, um, the hero part, I suppose you could call, is the, um, the PCA9685, oh, which is the PWM driver. And the reason for choosing that was simply to have 100% um, software compatibility with the reference design, because that's what's on the module. So when I was laying out this board, basically the very first thing I did was stick down one of those um, PWM driver chips and then start to fulfill all of the requirements of what it needs to actually work. So we need power for it. And in this case, what I did was just put down um, connections for an external module for a voltage regulator. Um, and then uh, part of this is looking through things like the data sheet for the chip itself. And there are certain addressing requirements that it needs. So I won't go into this in detail because it's specific to this design. But in this case, we needed um, pull downs on the address pins for I squared C. And there are a couple of other things that we needed to do just to make the chip work, basically. It's like um, plumbing. And once the, the basic requirements of whatever the core part are fulfilled, um, I then you go out from that and look at other uh, bits of more peripheral functionality, like how are we actually going to connect the, the, um, the servo? So we need headers for those, and then how do those link back into the main controller? So it begins with the most major building blocks from a logical point of view, and then add uh, all of the things that are required around it. Uh, and some of these are extras. For example, the RGB LEDs, they could be left totally off the design, and the core functionality would work fine, but this is just like, it's bling, it's something nice that we've got just to, uh, to play with. Um, Andy would argue that it's more than bling because it's actually really useful on a, um, a device that um, has Wi-Fi to be able to show things like um, whether it's managed to connect to the network and then once it's connected, has it actually connected to an MQTT broker? So you can get some feedback, you don't have a console to watch to see what's going on, you can see the progress of the software as it gets itself all sorted just by watching the LEDs. So at the moment, um, the LEDs aren't being driven, but um, that will be done. Um, and we've tested the, um, the circuit, so we can drive them. It's just tying them into being useful status indication is um, something that's to be done. Uh, so, yep. Yep, um, that's a great question. So the question was, when doing an emergency design like this, um, do I just jump straight into um, doing the design or do I go to the trouble of like hand assembling or hand wiring one first? So in this case, I had actually already put one together because I'd already assembled a donkey car using the module. And what I was really doing was taking that design that had already been prototyped and proven and replicating the schematic and then implementing it in a different physical way. And because we'd proven the design from the schematic point of view, I had fairly high confidence that it was okay. But there were some gotchas, hence, um, I'll get to that in a second, um, but that's why there's a bodge wire on it, because you can't necessarily predict everything. And uh, so part 
if I'm working on a project where I need a result as quickly as possible, part of the trade-off that I make is I would rather get a board that I can uh, rework and make it function in time than I have a board that's perfect and I don't get it in time, in which case it's useless to me. So in this case, I could have spent an extra day or two with doing things like testing the, um, the power setup for the LEDs, which is actually what caused the need for that little bodge wire. Um, but the trade-off that I made, or the decision that I made was, I would rather get this back and have the boards be 99% correct and then have to fix something than burn a day or two proving the design is correct, having them fabricated, and then not getting to the conference. So that's, sorry? I got them four days after I ordered them. So that was DHL from China. I basically fabricated overnight DHL. Um, so I'll just wrap up that part of the design process. Uh, I won't go into this in much more detail, but once the, um, the schematic is done, um, a lot of people do simulations at this point. I generally don't uh, because uh, sometimes I've done you know, prototyping on actual hardware first. Um, it's just something that is not normally part of my design process, but in some situations, simulation can be really important. And that's where you use software to execute the circuit, uh, basically in the computer, and it just pretends to be all of the dis different parts, and you see if it behaves the way you expect it to. And you can do things like examine what the voltages are at different parts of the circuit. So it's basically like running a, um, it's like running a virtual machine and then sticking a debugger on it. Um, but it's emulating hardware instead of software. So. Once the, um, the schematic is all sorted out, um, you then go over to the board layout. And at the start of the board layout, what you have is a big jumble of parts, and none of them are connected to each other. So uh, I, mean, I could be up here for the next two hours talking about this. <laughs> I'll cut this short. Um, the, um, the sequence that I go through in terms of uh, the layout of the PCB itself is first mechanical considerations. If you, ha you have to make your PCB fit on certain mounts or within a certain case or physical constraints, you've got to um, achieve those first. So set your boundaries and then think about how you're going to interface to the board. If you've got things that plug into it, where do you want those connectors to be? Do you want them on the edge of the PCB? Do they need to be at one end so that a cable will reach? Do they need a certain orientation so that a flex cable doesn't need to be twisted 90 degrees? So think about the physical constraints and do a rough placement of all of those parts of the design and then start moving the components and basically it's like um, it's solving a puzzle. You take the parts and you just start juggling them around and you can sit there for an hour or two just pushing parts around into different places. And what you see here is the result of, uh, for example, like look at this little row of resistors, which are all connected to pins on the chip. The reason that they're in a row like that is that they correlate to the logical connections they need to make to the, um, the pins on the chip. So technically those resistors could have been jumbled up in a different order, or they could have been elsewhere on the board. But then of course you're making a difficult job for yourself trying to get the tracks through to them. So uh, basically all I did was look at, oh, I need these resistors to match these pins. I'll just stick them in a row and then route down and it's really easy. So uh, once you have, there are some things like that that are really obvious. You can see that there is a direct one-to-one -one correlation. Those resistors need to be near those pins. It just makes sense. So what I typically do is I solve those sub-problems first and associate those parts and from then on, conceptually, I consider them to be like a block. So that um, chip and its associated resistors might end up being shoved somewhere else on the board, but they still stay in that general configuration. And um, so you're, you're essentially working at a, a meta level. You start um, narrow and then move blocks around and, um, and try to make it all fit neatly. Uh, and then finally, um, one thing that I think is really important if you're designing a PCB 
is to make it as self-documenting as possible. Um, one thing that a, a good friend of mine said to me a long time ago is, if you pull out a PCB that you haven't looked at for a year, and you have to look up the documents of what the LEDs are or what the connections are, then you've failed. You should be able to pull out an, a, a board and know what any of the connections is just by looking at it. You should know what voltage it needs to run at. So if you've got to look up a data sheet, you've failed. So uh, I've really taken that to heart and um, I try to document things as much as possible. So things like if there is a, um, you know, a plus and minus supply on a, uh, a PCB with screw terminals, I'll put in the voltage range. So I'll say this has to be between 7 and 28 volts. It has to be DC. This has to be positive. This has to be negative, et cetera. So you can just look at it and you don't, you, you don't have to guess. It's right there in front of you. So make the board self-documenting. Um, yeah, any other questions or should we move on? Okay. Thank you.